Welcome back again to pharmacotherapy. In this block, we'll briefly talk about the principles of biomedical ethics. And we'll be quite brief here, but we'll try to integrate this throughout the year, thinking about some of the ethical issues involved in pharmacotherapy and making decisions. There are really four principles of biomedical ethics. And my assumption or my hope is that you have had some experience with this already somewhere else uh, in another curriculum and that you also will have some exposure to this throughout this curriculum. The four basic principles are do good, do no harm, who makes the decision, and all other things being equal, if there are limited resources, how do we distribute those resources? So first, the, uh, the issue of beneficence or doing good. Uh, and so the question we always ask when we're intervening and working with a patient and uh, looking at providing a modality for treating a condition for a patient, our first plan is, are we, is this really in the best interest of the patient? Are we doing something good for this patient? It has some overtones of paternalism. There's often a concern that the healthcare provider has more knowledge or perspective than the patient does. Uh, and it has this sense of, well, because I know more, I'm, I'm going to tell you what to do. Um, but when there is an immediate risk for concern for the patient, uh, the kind of issue of we just jump in and do CPR on someone when we don't know what their code status is unless we've gotten that code status available for them, our first intent is all other things being equal, our intent is first to do good. That's the principle of beneficence. The second term is non-malfeasance or non-maleficence, depending on what part of the country you're from. Uh, and this is the adage of do no harm. And that's pretty much part of the Hippocratic Oath is do no, first do no harm. Uh, and our intent is to uh, be really clear about we understand what the risks are, we've assessed the risks, we've quantified what those risks are, we compare the risk to the benefit, and we balance the good with the harm. Uh, and with the other aspects we'll talk about in a minute of biomedical ethics. So the concern here would be uh, evaluating particularly therapies that have a lot of harm associated with them. For example, the toxicities of chemotherapy. So that uh, we weigh, we're weighing the decision of, hey, this chemotherapeutic regimen might extend this person's life by three months, but it's associated with a lot of toxicity with an increased fatality risk associated with neutral on uh, febrile neutropenia or some other uh, major problem. And this is sort of the downside of the equation. We evaluate what the risk is. The third issue is one of autonomy. And the, the issue here is who makes the decision. Uh, so it's, it's pretty clear in a competent adult that they ultimately are the patient is going to say yes or no because they come into your medical practice, they come into the hospital, and they sign a consent for treatment. They can deny that consent or they can say, I do not want to be treated in your facility. They could also say that I only want to be treated under these circumstances or here is my, uh, my wish that I don't want to be intubated or I don't want to be uh, have go through a code, I want to do not resuscitate order on me, something like that. That a willingness to uh, be treated or not treated is clear for a competent adult. It becomes less clear for folks who are incompetent or for minors. Uh, but usually in a complicated regimen, in addition to getting the initial consent for treatment early on when they first come into your practice or they walk in the door in the hospital where they sign the consent to be treated, there might be a specific modality that you're going to intervene with and this patient recommend that has a high risk associated with it. And in that circumstance, you may wish to look into getting a specific informed consent specific around that intervention. If you're involving the use of anything that is investigational, a drug, for example, that is not yet FDA approved, then you absolutely need to get informed consent that informed consent is drafted and evaluated by both the investigators and an independent board called the Institutional Review Board that will evaluate the appropriateness of that statement. And it's usually pages long. It's 
following standard format that you've described in easy to understand terms what the risks and the benefits are of that patient agreeing to that therapy. You'll always want to look at circumstances of getting specific informed consent when it's anything controversial, uh, when it involves incompetent individuals, or, or it has anything to do with investigational research. Finally, we've weighed the good, we've weighed the bad, we are thoughtful of who is making the decision. But the final issue is one of distributive justice, and this assumes that there are not unlimited resources, that we have limited resources. If there are really unlimited resources and this particular intervention won't impact those resources, then this is a non-issue. Where it is an issue is when there are limited resources and the decision uh, to move forward or to withhold therapy impacts other people. An example is that you are working in the emergency department, you have three patients who need intensive care level of service, but the intensive care unit only has two open beds. Which two patients get those beds and why, how is that decision made and who is the, the third person out? Um, or there might be that there's a drug shortage. We deal with this in pharmacy all the time in the last decade. We have drug shortages for everything, including things that are surprisingly common, very frustrating for us. Uh, we have years where we have a short supply of influenza vaccine. And so we have to triage that vaccine based on its availability to, to individuals for whom it will offer the most benefit uh, with perhaps the least risk. So uh, for healthy adults, for example, younger adults, they may be the last people to be able to be getting the influenza vaccine in short supply. But we've tried to be clear that this process of making the decision about who gets and, and by its very nature, who doesn't get that resource uh, is an issue. Where it gets uh, also sort of cloudy is, is when the, let's say for example, you've got an intervention, for example, a course of chemotherapy that maybe the chemotherapeutic regimen will increase the person's life by a month or two. And the full course of chemotherapy costs over a million dollars. Now that may sound outrageous, but it's absolutely not in this day and age that course of the chemotherapy can really cost that much money. The issue then becomes if we sort of move forward and that becomes a standard of practice to use this multi-million do million dollar or more uh, intervention on every patient with this condition with the expectation that we're going to extend life by, you know, weeks uh, and maybe the quality of life may not be much better. The, the distributive justice question in that equation is that sooner or later somebody has to pay for all that chemotherapy and that might be that everyone else on insurance premiums, their premiums will go up because they're required to pay for that. Now you could make the argument and it gets other issues as well, can't the drug companies charge less for it? Yes, or can't you do? There are many sort of corollaries you can go down, avenues you can go down. But the issue with distributive justice involves when there are some kind of limited resources, who gets what and who gets denied if anyone gets denied a therapy or an intervention. So in practice, no matter what clinical scenario you're faced with with a patient, these are four things that ought to be automatically become integrated in your thought process. So what is the good I'm doing for this patient? What is the harm I'm doing for this patient? We've already looked at weighing the risk and the benefit. The other two issues that affect this are who makes the decision? Is it the patient making the decision? Have you informed the patient well enough so the patient can make that decision? Uh, and ultimately, are there any distributive justice issues around the use of that medicine or not? Okay, very good.